today is an opportunity for me to chat with you a little bit about what that new normal looks like. That's something that David brought up just a little while ago that, no, we, we won't be returning to the old normal, but we have to figure out what the new normal looks like, uh, especially in higher education, because our students' experiences have changed. Um, our uh, faculty and staff's experiences have changed. The country has now changed um, and changed in a very, uh, at a very rapid pace. And so what does that mean for us as we move forward as administrators, as decision makers and influencers in higher education? So I think it's important for us to consider all of that. So for all of those folks that I was blessed and fortunate enough to be with last year in person, um, last year I went back and looked at my notes from last year's keynote. And what was so ironic was that almost every single point was a consideration uh, for this year, especially in 2020 as we attempted to pivot and shift into new situations and literally unprecedented, which I almost cringe when I hear that word now, um, unprecedented territory when it comes to higher education. We talked about lots of things like awareness, for example, being aware of where the challenges are in higher ed and how we should approach them and attack them. We talked about energy. What kind of energy are we bringing into our spaces? What energy are we allowing to be around us as administrators and decision makers? We specifically talked about problems. How are we being creative about problems? Are we addressing the old problems with old solutions or are we building new and innovative teams to come up with new solutions? We definitely talked about uh, what our recovery looks, looks like and that was before a pandemic. <laughs> what does recovery look like? How do we respond and bounce back when we encounter challenges and situations? We definitely talked about um, how quickly we bounce back and also um, how quickly we can pivot and be intentional about the work that we do. Um, are we sure that we're going to fail or are we sure that we're going to succeed? Um, hopefully our end result uh, will definitely be what we want it to be, but the process and the steps from here to there might pivot and might be different. So what does that mean as far as teaching and learning on our college campuses? And then, of course, I think the message that will continue in higher education is resilience. Um, as you mentioned before, we've had hundreds of years of higher education in this country, so that inherently means that someone was pers persistent in the work that they were doing. It's up to us to continue that historic trend of how are we going to continue to push forward and not give up in the work that we do, especially in the faces of major challenges. And so today I wanted to kind of approach what those new challenges are and what new normals might look like. Um, I'm a very visual learner, so I've tried to encapsulate what we were already anticipating uh, going into this year and how that shifted and changed over time. Um, so for example, we weren't anticipating COVID-19. That, that just wasn't uh, something we anticipated. Um, however, we were uh, anticipating an election year. We were anticipating a mental health concerns of our students, faculty, and staff because that's been uh, a lot of the work that campuses have been doing over the years. In fact, uh, each January, my faculty holds what's called a faculty, um, faculty teaching conference. It's every January, the first paycheck of the year, if you will. Um, it used to be historically that when we still had paper paychecks, all of our faculty had to come on campus to pick them up. And so during the month of January, there was no teaching going on. So we used a captive audience who needed to come in for paychecks to come in and do some, some teach-ins and some learning around some professional development. And we've continued that trend even though we've gone to direct deposit and technology. Um, and one of the things that we talked about for the entire theme of our January teaching conference was around the mental health of our students and our faculty and our staff. I would think even more so now that we have been going through COVID-19 and many folks have experienced, uh, of course, the loss of life, um, Myself personally, even though um, I did not have a loved one to pass from COVID-19, I did have a death in my family as well. Um, it's very tough when COVID-19 restrictions determine even how you can grieve. Um, and so given that mental health is a concern for all of us that approach college campuses. Um, of course, we know that we are in uh, heavily in the throes of another wave of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we've seen on various campuses where Juneteenth has been declared a holiday, a university holiday, or even a state holiday. Uh, and what does that mean? Um, and then, of course, uh, the untimely murder of George Floyd and the history of murders in our country um, at the hands of uh, police brutality. And what does that mean for how we understand the world? And so given all of this, we definitely have a new normal that we will have to build, construct, even reconstruct in many different ways. And 
all of these are very hard topics that were difficult before 2020, but now it's heightened awareness uh, that we have to consider in the work that we do in higher education because students are calling us as senior administrators to be responsible um, for moderating some of these discussions and our colleges and universities' responses uh, to these challenges. What I thought was pretty cool, um, I have an archivist who's wonderful, uh, Felicity Knox, and she went back and looked back uh, to some of the photos that we had from previous pandemics at Towson University, right outside of Baltimore. And this is one of them in particular. This was um, a few weeks before uh, a major pandemic in 1918 where we had our nursing department um, in our oldest, uh, oldest building on campus, Stevens Hall, um, and they were having a teach-in specifically, and the captioning that we found in the archives was specifically around the benefits of wearing or not wearing masks. Um, so as you can tell, um, in 1918, we we're circling back around to 2020 with some of the very same conversations and what can we learn from um, some of our predecessors in higher education. And I think we can challenge ourselves to look at all of these different issues, whether it's general elections, whether it's um, leading and teaching, what can we learn from times past that we can use uh, moving forward as we persist through uh, the major challenges? Well, one of the things that I wanna consider as we think about what new normal looks like is that we wanna make sure we don't repeat some of the challenges of the past. And one of those particular challenges is a, a quote that I have used for several years from uh, the prolific uh, filmmaker, Spike Lee. And he talked about Christopher Columbus syndrome in particular. And what that means is, of course, the notion of people, commonly white people, suddenly learning about trends, food, or places that already existed, and then trumpeting their discovery. Um, and what we're seeing now, and if you open up any, um, if you even open up the Amazon app on your phone or look at Amazon online, you will find that the top 10 bestsellers out of uh, the 10 of them, Nine of them are specifically around privilege, white privilege, race, and anti-racism. Nine out of the top 10. And given that, there's been this awakening. Um, I would not say this is an awakening of uh, people of color in particular, but it is an awakening of folks who want to become potential allies to the causes of people of color and women. And given that, what's really interesting is that we have to be very careful as to how we understand racism, how we understand anti-racism, um, even within our curriculum and the work that we do, and also understanding that this is a, not a new concept. In fact, there's an entirely um, supportive concept around uh, emotional labor and what it means for oppressed individuals to ha handle this entire load, carry this load for many years. And so what we now have is an influx of folks um, that may identify as white or at least as non-black who are talking about anti-racism. Uh, they're studying racism. They're studying um, lots of uh, books and research and scholars that have been in the trenches for decades around these concepts and what that means for moving forward. And so um, the challenge now is what does a good ally look like? What does a strong ally look like? What does a strong white ally look like? And how do we ensure that um, we reinforce the fact that this is not new knowledge or new experience, but it is new to a particular group of individuals that can use their power and leverage it uh, to be supportive as allies to people of color as well as to women. So given that, we have to be aware of what that Christopher Columbus syndrome actually feels like, looks like, and make sure that folks know that just because it's new to you does not mean that it's a new experience to everyone. And what does that mean as far as jumping into a stream of history rather than the beginning of a history? So Christopher Columbus history is, uh, syndrome is not new, but it's one that has been used in pop culture and also used in research uh, quite a bit. Another thing I would consider, even as we're thinking about um, building this new normal, one of the things that's been crucial is embracing the Mavericks on our campus. Now, uh, Maverick, as you might think of, oftentimes people think of the language of Maverick in politics. Uh, so who's the Maverick that's running for office in particular? But this is being used in a little bit of a different way. Maverick is defined as an unorthodox person or an independent-minded thinker. Um, they're someone who's an individualist, a nonconformist, a free spirit, of course, unorthodox, but they're unconventional and they're probably a trendsetter in some way. They're one that uh, usually stands out, they stick out in some way, they might be an outsider, 
But what's very cool about this is that we've been finding that there's a lot of research that talks about diversity and inclusion in new ways that refers to diversity as essential to building solution-oriented teams. The reason why I use this particular uh, picture, hopefully some of you recognize who this person is in particular, uh, this gentleman's name is Maverick Carter. Maverick Carter is the childhood friend of LeBron James and it, in fact is uh, the mastermind behind a lot of his business deals and a lot of the work that he's done in media around uh, sports and not just another athlete. So um, given that Maverick uh, actually lives up to his name, that's actually his legal name, um, which I think is pretty cool. But I think uh, we can take a lot of lessons from what it means to be a Maverick. What does it mean to be that person who happens to be the one who uh, seems to be a little bit outlandish and outside of tradition, and then you end up being the person that brings the, gr the greatest solutions? Um, it was really funny when I provided the, uh, the keynote from last year to APC, uh, to my supervisor, who's the provost of the university, and I said, hey, what direction should I go in with these folks for 2020? She said, oh my goodness, you're like a fortune teller, uh, because everything that you talked about last year actually is something that's being considered in the work that we do in senior administration. And you probably were seen as the outsider when you brought this forward, but now this is the actual trend. And so given that, I would, if, if I were you, think about the folks that are around you in leadership who, who are usually the mavericks. Who are the people that are bringing forth solutions that have been non-traditional that might be extremely useful in the work that you're doing moving forward, especially to and through COVID-19? Chief diversity officers. Um, this is something that's not a new trend, but also uh, I think what's fascinating about um, following chief diversity officers is that um, many chief diversity officers are now calling universities to major leadership around what that means. In the first couple of decades of the trend of establishing a chief diversity officer, a lot of institutions created a position but did not create a team. And that unfortunately flies in the face of what senior administrators look for when it comes to collaboration and building inclusion and equity into the fabric of the entire university. Um, unfortunately, if you're a chief diversity officer, you do not have a magic wand that you pull out from under your desk and you wave four times and everyone spins around and now we're diverse and inclusive. Um, but instead what happens is chief diversity officers that are most successful have very clear strategic plans that are integrated into the entire college's strategic plan as one piece. Another piece is that they do have a staff. They do not have to be a huge staff, but they do need to meet the needs of the particular university. When I'm asked um, on many occasions, how large should a chief diversity officer's staff be? I ask them the question, what are your major concerns on your campus? Is it around faculty? Is it around staff? Is it around human resources? Uh, is it around finances or uh, even sponsored, uh, sponsored research? The number of problems or challenges that you might have on campus as it relates to diversity and inclusion will probably predict how many people that you need to handle those situations. Uh, my university I can use as an example of this. Prior to my arrival four years ago, almost five years ago, uh, the president decided that she wanted to create a vice president of inclusion and institutional equity. And on top of that, uh, not only did she create the CDO position, but she also created an entire office and charged the individual with crafting a strategic plan that included a heavy hand around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then within the first two years, that vice president found they needed at least five people to staff uh, a campus the size of ours, which is almost 30,000 students. Um, and therefore that began to unfold the needs and the resources that were provided. Um, I do an exercise in my course every year um, in the spring around inclusive leadership, whether it's inclusive school leadership, K through 12, or inclusive campus leadership in higher ed. I specifically ask my master's students and doctoral level students to look at 10 different chief diversity officer job descriptions. Uh, they're usually called leadership profiles by search committees. And what they do is they look at each and every one of those leadership profiles or job descriptions, and they give me a brief synopsis of what their major challenges will be, whoever is appointed to that, to that position, and also tell me a little bit of, about how much power do they perceive this person having. Oftentimes, it's a chief diversity officer or a vice presidential role or a vice provost, what have you, um, who is entitled um, focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion, but when asked about administrative support, staff, 
even soft money as far as budget and there's not much there. And so I have a very long uh, title, if you will. <laughs> I'm the uh, Assistant Provost for Diversity and Inclusion. Um, however, we had to look at where is the power in that role? Is it just a title as far as symbolism or is there power? I do have a good bit of power. I'm at every table when it comes to our president's cabinet, um, as far as our provost cabinet. Um, and I also have uh, a number of deans that report uh, directly to me for their diversity and inclusion needs. So what kind of resources are being provided for those chief diversity officers? And are they given the leeway to exercise those resources? So I think all of that is extremely important to consider if you're a person in senior administration that has to consider what type of resources are being provided. Now, this is another area where I did a bit of a workshop on last year with you all, and I know that not everyone was privy to that information, but I wanted to revisit some of this in a little more detail because it's becoming extremely important, especially in a COVID-19 environment. Faculty development in particular. Um, Faculty development is something where we usually don't use the language of training. Um, it's very offensive to folks who have PhDs to talk about training as if they should need any more. They've gone through K through 23, K through 30 for some of them. Um, but we think it's very important to think about what professional development looks like. So how is it different for a pre-tenure faculty member versus a post-tenure faculty member? How is it different for, for a clinical faculty member versus an adjunct faculty member? Um, how is it different for a postdoc who's interested in becoming part of the pipeline of faculty on your campus? So we need that professional development on all levels in lots of different ways. Uh, another piece of that puzzle also is technology and Wi-Fi access. If you are like us um, out in Baltimore, um, a lot of people think that we are in Baltimore City. We're actually in Baltimore County, but we also have an average mileage of commute for our faculty members between 40 and 50 miles. And so given that it's not uncommon for someone like me who's in senior administration, but also teaches as a faculty member who has an average commute of about an hour. And so given that many of us live in some of the remote areas, we don't necessarily live in the city. What does that mean as far as a, a rainy or a cloudy day uh, when it comes to the access that I have to my students, especially when it relates to technology? So what type of technological supports are we providing for our faculty members to teach well um, when it comes to new resources. Another piece of that puzzle, of course, is online course designers. I think what happens with a lot of faculty members is that, especially as we've had to pivot during COVID-19, is that they are exceptional teachers face-to-face. -face. Some are even pretty strong online, but what does that mean as far as building their tool chest of resources when it comes to course design? I've had this experience even myself as I've been working with um, the concept of intergroup dialogue, which actually comes from the University of Michigan's model. And in particular, we're using a model from University of Michigan that has consistently been face-to-face -face and in-person. But now because of COVID-19, of course, we have social distancing, which means that we need to push forward with some of the skill sets of dialogue, which is extremely important during the election year, extremely important for students with civic engagement, extremely important for courses that have uh, very difficult dialogues embedded in the work, for example, multicultural competence, uh, even uh, political science, for example. And so given that we have hired four new course designers whose sole purpose is to help faculty take their existing content and pivot and swerve into the online course environment. So there are people that uh, literally have master's degrees. One of my closest friends has a master's degree in online course design. So given that, we'll need to provide those resources to our faculty. Their uh, specialty is the content, but our specialty as faculty development folks is to uh, give them lots of tools to put in their toolkit for how that delivery happens. I would also suggest that faculty mentoring programs are extremely important. What we know for mentoring of faculty is that it's crucial to, of course, students, but it's also crucial to pre-tenure faculty and it's crucial to underrepresented faculty. So what the research bears out with what we know is faculty mentoring, uh, of course, can increase our faculty retention. And so I believe that every faculty member should have a mentor, whether it's a, a uh, formal mentor or an, an unofficial mentor. But when it comes to underrepresented faculty, they need a network of mentors. So whether they're in their department, 
outside of their department, in another college, um, in another um, program, um, even if they're within APC, for example. There's lots of different ways for mentoring to happen, but it must be intentional for it to be done quite well. I would also suggest that inclusive classroom curricula is extremely important. One of the things I've been working on over the last year is called Inclusive Classroom 1.0. And it's a 14 module um, curriculum for our faculty members when it comes to inclusive teaching around various identities of students and also around the process of course redesign. Um, so for example, any of my faculty members can come and take a course specifically on how to be more inclusive of LGBT students in their classroom. And we also have what's called our capstone, our faculty capstone, where those faculty members can bring in a syllabus that they're working on and actually work through that, that, uh, so that syllabus with a online course designer to help them reimagine their courses, even courses that they've been teaching for a decade. So given that inclusive classroom curricula, this allows our senior administrators who focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion work to make that very real and tangible for faculty. I'm very blessed and fortunate on my campus to have lots of faculty members who have constantly been interested in making their classrooms more inclusive, but they needed the how. They needed the nuts and bolts of good teaching practices in order to do that, and that's what we provide through that curriculum. Um, and then the last piece, and this is something I literally just uh, hung up from my last Zoom call about, was specifically around faculty, chair, and dean administrator training. So it is not helpful to uh, put someone in a chair position or a dean position and then expect them to know what they're doing. They're exceptional teachers. That does not mean that they're exceptional administrators yet. And so given that, we provide them a lot of those tools. So for example, annual checklists of things that need to happen throughout the academic year. Of course, it's a suggestion, it's not a requirement. Um, also, when we provide them with our online catalog of resources when it um, pertains to databases they need to be aware of, some of the back-end functioning of HR and budgeting that they need to be able to approve. A lot of these resources have been provided all in one place, and now we're moving forward in August, we have what's called our Council of Chairs. Um, and so all of the chairs on our campus are invited to participate in this training um, and for our structure on our campus and this will be different based on your college but we have some faculty members who have been promoted to a chair position and we have other folks who were hired from outside the university into a chair position so there may be folks that need to be oriented to the role or they may need to be re uh, they may need to be oriented to the role and to the university at large and so given that those are some of the big pieces of faculty development that we try to uh, put in place at the university throughout the academic year. I think another piece of the puzzle that we wanna make sure we consider in particular is around protest and what protest looks like. Um, if you're not familiar with the history, there's a number of different books that actually traces the history of social protest in higher ed. Um, and what I thought was pretty profound about these side-by-side -side pictures that I found um, in a number of, of um, a, a number of resources, and I also talked to a friend of mine who literally wrote a textbook on students and social unrest and student protest, is that we know that student protest has been happening actually since the late 1800s. These pictures just happen to be relevant because we're in a Black Lives Matter uh, resurgence, if you will, um, where that, of course, on the left side, we have a photo of uh, African-American students down in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, that are protesting, um, and so, that's one piece of the puzzle in 1960. And then this particular picture is from a Black Lives Matter rally that happened in September of 2019. So given this, the protests have continued over many, many years. And I think what's important is um, not to ignore uh, the needs of students who want to protest, but one of my policies that I've been working with uh, on my last two campuses is around being very transparent around what's allowed and what's not allowed when it comes to social protest what is allowed on campus and what is not allowed on campus. And in particular, putting structures in place, especially within uh, student activism, civic engagement, and your student affairs divisions around what can we do to keep students safe, regardless of their perspective, regardless of their approach, what can we do to keep all students safe and allow students to have voice on campus? And so what I've unfortunately found at my last two institutions was that, of course, students will always protest um, and we can pick and choose what topic it's going to be around. But 
one of my campuses was extremely transparent on the process of protest and what's going to be in place to keep students safe, especially bringing in campus safety, our uh, sworn campus police officers, um, student affairs, who's present at events and who's not. So for example, we know if there's something going on on campus, our vice president of student affairs, our provost, and the majority of our senior administrators will be present, at least one of us, but most times many more. So what does that protocol look like to keep students safe? as they protest because we know it's an inevitable part of higher education. And in fact, the approach that we've been taking has been more of a developmental approach. What can students learn as a result of participating in social protest? Many students that we find that parlay out of the university as they graduate, they move on to positions that actually allow them to work with equity and inclusion issues. And many times they recall back to their experiences of protest and social unrest as part of their qualifications moving into jobs. And so what does that mean as far as approaching social unrest and protest in ways that are part of the education, part of the extracurricular, rather than something that goes as an unmentionable that we kind of don't wanna talk about because students will be talking about this. Uh, we've talked about this uh, previously. Um, again, this is another uh, visual that I used last year, but I wanted to go into further depth because we only use this in a workshop and not in the keynote in particular. Going back to our faculty work, what does this look like as far as recruitment, hiring, and retention policies of all of our faculty, but especially diverse faculty? There is a system that can be used. This is a cycle that I use on my campus. Unfortunately, um, we've increased the, uh, the percentage of diverse faculty in the last year. It has increased 9%, which is um, very difficult to do, um, especially in a lot of different fields where we don't have a lot of uh, individuals who are underrepresented who receive terminal degrees. And so given that, there's a cycle to this, and I'll just gu guide you through very briefly. I do an entire workshop just on this particular topic. Um, but the recruitment, search, and hire strategies. What is the strategy that we're using to recruit? This cannot be a build it and they will come model, but more so, how are we networking? How are we asking faculty to go back to all of their previous institutions to connect with graduate schools or connect with their undergraduate institutions for students who might be interested in a postdoc experience or might be interested in a fellowship or even a one-year position that might turn in uh, from a clinical position to a tenure track position? What might that look like? But we have to get very unconventional. Um, one of the things that I've been doing that's been quite successful for my university in particular is a lot of recruitment through social media. And that social media may be closed in many ways. So for example, right now, I can log onto my Facebook page and open up an entire Facebook group that is a closed group of 30,000 people of color who have terminal degrees. I can go in there and post job descriptions for individuals based on the area, and then they're able to apply to the position. This happens all the time. I'm in part of a group that's a Latinx group that's specifically Latinx faculty member, faculty members who are looking for positions that they want to connect with our campuses. So what are we going to do differently? Those uh, traditional models of, oh, going to the conference and we'll uh, kind of softly interview folks or just posting in the Chronicle and seeing what happens those have not worked for diversifying faculty. They have worked for recruitment generally, but not for diversifying recruiting pools specifically. So how are we working with that? I also would suggest too, um, working with uh, the Center for Minority Serving Institutions that's out of Rutgers. Uh, that's one of the institutions that has a entire catalog of every single minority serving institution in the country, whether it's a historically black college or university whether it's a Hispanic serving institution or even a tribal college. Uh, we also have specialty institutions such as military institutions and also institutions like Gallaudet University that serves the deaf or hard of hearing. So given, given that, we have to think very strategically about how we're going to recruit. Faculty onboarding is it's extremely important and it's based on what the department oftentimes will say. So drilling down to the department chair, this is a major predictor of whether folks stay or whether folks go as faculty. How are they greeted? How are they onboarded? How much information are they given when they start? Is it a three-day institute that faculty are given or is it a monthly half-day session where we're giving them a little bit at a time starting from inside the classroom to out to the broader college? So what does onboarding look like and is it welcoming uh, to those new faculty members? Who, it, who at your college is responsible for touch points. 
who's going to touch base with those faculty members on an ongoing basis. This does not necessarily mean supervision, but it does mean uh, staying visible for that faculty member. So whether it's an ombudsperson, whether it's a assistant provost position like my own, whether it's a vice president of inclusion, whoever that, that might be, it could even be an affinity group of faculty members, but who's gonna be the designated touch point for those faculty members coming on your campus? Uh, of course, the ongoing faculty development curriculum, which I talked about in a previous slide, so I won't go too far into that. Um, and then in the inevitable case that we have folks that need to leave the college, what does the exit interview process look like? Oftentimes there's a human resources office that provides exit interviews, but oftentimes they're um, tailored towards the general employee or someone who might be a staff person. But what does that look like specifically for faculty? How do you ask questions specifically around their experience with their academic work, their scholarship, and their teaching in the classroom, even the tenure track process? There have to be specific questions so we can get to the root of why people are leaving and that inherently helps us to determine why they stay and shore up some of those responsibilities. So all of this is crucial to that cycle. When it comes to um, a lot of what we've been experiencing more recently, especially in regards to the Black Lives Matter movement, but just in general, when it comes to um, our student socialization process and how they communicate, I think it's extremely important to look at the literature that speaks to the call out culture versus the call in culture. Now, when we talk about the call out culture in particular, it's a culture of letting someone know that either their words or their actions are unacceptable to them as, as a person of color, as a woman, as someone who's underrepresented, maybe a LGBT individual or an indigenous person. What does this mean when we call someone out for something that they've uh, said uh, or done? And then how do we intercept or at least interrupt that behavior? It could be a microaggression where the individual truly does not know what they've done is offensive, or it could be a macroaggression where the person is very aware of what's going on, but the oppressed person wants to make sure that they interrupt that behavior and stop that behavior. So the call out culture has been to call out that person, but there has been no reconciliation, there's been no discussion, there's been no deeper understanding around what just happened. Call in culture is quite different in that there's an opportunity to make meaning together as to why this happened, why this was used, why this particular language was used, why even this response happened. Um, and so given that the call in culture is crucial to making sure that students, faculty, staff stay in dialogue with one another, because that doesn't guarantee agreement, but it does help with deeper understanding. Um, like I mentioned before, I believe uh, the University of Michigan has been using what's called a interrelations dialogue model, and on my campus we call it a intergroup dialogue model that helps us to groom students, faculty, and staff into that call in culture. So, for example, if someone were to say something uh, offensive, either to me in person or even in an online teaching learning environment, instead of saying, hey, Donna, that's offensive to me, or hey, that hurt my feelings, instead it would be, Donna, tell me more about that language in particular and why that's being used, or uh, say more about what you just suggested, or are you aware of this particular language being offensive or a slur, for example? Um, I think it was a, it's a great opportunity for folks to learn this skill set because this may be a skill set that's not used quite often because we don't necessarily use dialogue model even in the classroom. Oftentimes we use teaching, which may be a banking style, or we oftentimes use discussion where people may want to uh, present their case, um, or we may even use debate where we're trying to get into a persuasive space. But instead, dialogue is not at all about persuasion, but it is very much about deeper understanding. So that's when we get into this call-in culture of seeking to understand, not necessarily agree. And then also it's focused on reflection of what an individual might have experienced, what I was thinking or not thinking when I had this behavior, and what does this mean as far as my relearning um, or retooling as I move forward. So this call out versus call in culture is extremely important, especially in an age of social media, which I personally love. It can be a fantastic tool, but it also can be used in call out culture that doesn't aid in dialogue if it's not used in a very skilled uh, and thoughtful way. If we had not thought about this before, I think we need to move forward as uh, making sure that this is a, a cornerstone of the work that we do in higher education. 
Um, oftentimes we think about mental health through the framework of students. Uh, but like I mentioned before, based on a lot of the faculty development that I've been doing on my campus and some of the research, we have to be very clear on how we're going to support faculty mental health and hygiene as well. So for example, yes, it is important for us to circle back to that faculty member if there was a student who uh, lashed out in a classroom or if there was a difficult dialogue or um, if there was a triggering situation that happened in a classroom. What does that mean in the classroom and how are we going to support our faculty as part of their own development as a person and as a professional? What does it mean to possibly uh, in my department, for example, let's say David and I are, uh, we're in the same academic department and I know that certain topics are gonna be triggering to me in a particular class period. It's great self care for me to remember that, hey, I'm teaching a course on this particular topic the discussion amongst my students may go into an area that might be very triggering for me, but I have my colleague down the hallway that in case I need to send a 911 for, for him to come and take over my course for a few moments for me to regroup, we already have that relationship built and we know how to segue in a great way that demonstrates self-care but also keeps the teaching cohesive in the classroom. What does that look like? And so there's lots of strategies. This is just one of many. Um, that we've used, uh, but it's something to think about when it comes to the emotional, behavioral, cognitive well-being of our students, our faculty, and our staff. Um, I'll give you another example um, that has happened on, on one of my campuses in past years, um, is that a student was not faring well in a course, and uh, there were students, faculty, staff that were walking um, on a sidewalk through the campus, going over to the campus union, and unfortunately, uh, they witnessed a student that attempted uh, a jump from the eighth story of a parking structure. Um, so not only did we need to consider those faculty, staff, students uh, that witnessed that event, but also what does this mean for the classmates of that student when that, when that student doesn't come back to class or uh, the students that may be uh, staying in a residence hall or anyone that's connected within that web of students, what does that mean as far as the response? On my campus in particular, um, and this is great kudos to my uh, brand new vice president of student affairs on my campus, wonderful human being that just started uh, in his vice presidency back in February. In the first two weeks of his vice presidency, we had a student who literally dropped dead playing Friday night basketball um, in our recreation center. And he had been uh, playing with friends for weeks and weeks. Um, this was not an uncommon occurrence. Um, this happened in front of students. In, at a, um, in our recreation center, which obviously has lots of windows, so lots of folks could see what happened. Um, and on top of that, we had first responders that came, um, and one of the first responders had a medical incident happen as they were responding to that student. Um, and then within the next two weeks, we had an entire quarantine. So um, our vice president of student affairs has been working overtime. These are examples of situations where mental health and hygiene needs to be considered for various constituents on our campuses. So given that, I know I've thrown a lot out at you and I promised Donna that I was gonna stay in a particular time uh, because I know there's so much that we could talk about in the time of COVID. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to uh, kind of pause and allow everyone to take a deep breath here. Um, and from there, I'm hoping that uh, Donna or Josh um, if you would, please uh, share with me any questions that, that might come forward. But I want to say this, even in all of this that's going on in the world, um, in our country and in higher ed, I have hope I would not have uh, returned back to you all if I didn't have hope for what higher ed can do. Um, one of the things that I've been doing as far as health self-care, and I encourage you all to do, um, is chronicle what you have been experiencing as a higher ed administrator. I don't care if you set up an Instagram uh, account and you take one picture every day that brings you hope in higher ed in the midst of COVID-19, or if you take the opportunity to get a journal and write two sentences about something that was profound for you each and every day. Um, but what I know is that 100 years from now, again, just like that 1918 photo that we saw previously, 100 years from now, someone else will go through a COVID-19. Someone else will go through another major world incident. Someone will be going through a general election that may change the world. And they will be looking back to us as leaders to figure out, okay, success leaves clues. And, and we're hoping and praying that all of us in 2020 is leaving successful clues for people in the next century. So it's my hope, if you would, to 
think about how you're chronicling your experiencing. How are you using that as self-care? And how are we kind of being the, the ancestors of higher ed that people would look back to to say, hey, president, what did you do in this situation? Because I know it was tough. Hey, provost, what were you doing? Hey, VP, what were you doing? Because we need you. <laughs> we need your voice. We need your past experiences to lead us in a very uncertain time. So it's my hope that we can take all of this in and hopefully be kind of the, the ancestors of higher education that we need right now for the future. So thank you for listening in to this time together. I'm blown away by the response and kudos to Donna for the great marketing. Um, and I'm so uh, happy to entertain any questions or concerns you might have for me. All right. Well, thank you very much, Shauna. That was um, that was just awesome. I mean, you really you you gave us a lot of good ideas that I'm sure will resonate with a lot of APC members. You took several of the challenges that we're facing um, and offered us ideas and suggestions for consideration. I mean, everything from COVID-19 to the diversity factors, student protests, um, especially the part about calling in versus calling out kind of resonated with me personally. Um, I thought that was a really good way to, you know, diffuse what could be a potentially difficult situation. Um, and even the mental health aspect of all of this um, that we're all facing right now. I didn't see any questions per se in the Zoom um, group chat, but I mean, we're all a very close knit group. I mean, if anybody wants to unmute themselves, offer any questions or suggestions, um, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, pass those on, Shona, or Shauna can address them, but any, any thoughts or questions? I have one. Go ahead, David. So, uh, first of all, also thank you on, again, on behalf of the board and all the member institutions. That was a wonderful uh, presentation, and it, it's all good to bring in colleagues from, from other states and other sectors. We can learn so much from, from sharing perceptions. I was wondering if you could share some suggestions for how we might get out in front of the conversation when classes resume, so that the conversation is as constructive in dialogue, in, and and uh, constructive as possible in, in the dialogue. We know that our students are going to want to talk about these things. We know they're going to be looking for leadership, and so how do we we create that environment where it can happen so that we help move America forward? Gr great question, David. Um, if, let me uh, share a funny with you. Um, back in fall of 2019, we were already talking about how intergroup dialogue, courageous conversations could help us with the general election that we were, that we were anticipating. Um, and then COVID-19 struck and we still have those challenges. Even fact, I, in fact, I would say it's to an elevated level because we're not just talking about the election, we're talking about race, we're talking about um, police brutality, we're talking about lots of things going into a very crucial time period. Um, one of the things that we've done, and we've also worked in collaboration with other campuses, is that um, a few things we're doing. The first thing we're doing is we actually moved several of our dialogues. Um, we created them online, in online spaces. And in fact, what was so powerful about it, um, and this literally happened this morning, uh, we scheduled all of our dialogues for the year, for the summer, excuse me, for the remainder of the summer, leading into the fall and the general election. And what was powerful was that uh, we did have senior administrators that um, expressed their interest in either guiding those conversations as certified facilitators, um, or they volunteered to be a part of those conversations, which was powerful because it um, really symbolized the importance of why dialogue and calling in versus calling out is so important. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked with our Salesforce folks um, and uh, worked together to create a series of dialogues, and they're all centered on particular topics. So, for example, we uh, have affinity group discussions, for example. So one of which is on, um, it's helping our, Af our African-American faculty, staff, students to process the Black Lives Matter movement. We're working with uh, non-Black people of color in an affinity group to process the Black Lives Matter movement. We're having a space for our white colleagues and students to process the Black Lives Matter movement. So we have those moving forward. Um, we also have an entire scaffolding process of, um, and this is something that was floating around, but we kind of built on it. Um, there was a scaffolding of anti-racism resources that was floating around that we added to, and it was based on your level of expertise and experience. So it went from, uh, from one area of, I don't see race and I, uh, I want everyone to be, 
I want everyone to be treated equally from that point all the way up to I've been working in DEI work for decades and I just want to sharpen my skills. And so there's probably six different uh, levels of that scaffolding in between. And we built upon that. We pulled in some of our faculty members who are already on staff that um, were already doing research and doing uh, lots of scholarship around these topics, but also our DEI professionals like our vice president of inclusion, myself as assistant provost, et cetera. And we're guiding those, ex those reading groups as well. And I think what was so powerful was that we blocked off 90 minutes to two hours for each one of these sessions. And when I looked back at my Salesforce information, uh, we tried to make sure that it was capped off at 50 for each discussion. We're gonna end up having to duplicate each and every discussion because we had waiting lists for every single discussion. So that's one thing that we're doing before anybody even approaches campus in the fall for our flex schedule. And it's a great way to start thinking about things because frankly, if you start in August, you're already too late. Frankly, right now I'm feeling late and we've been working on this since last September. So I think the challenge is to um, pull together some of those discussion groups with folks that are skilled in difficult dialogues, uh, conflict mediation, uh, conflict resolution, conflict transformation, that language. Um, so I would definitely pull some of those folks in. Um, and then I also would consider those reading groups uh, like I mentioned before, um, there are a number of resources around all the topics that I've talked about today. We're not saying folks have to go out and read a 300 page textbook, um, but they can read articles or we're, we're calling them sparks where it's multimedia. So um, as I mentioned before, we have folks that have a, an hour commute to campus, for example. So they may wanna listen to the audio book, but they may just wanna read the five page article or they may wanna listen to the TED talk or they may wanna listen to the podcast but we've provided those resources based on that scaffolding so people can engage on the topic and then use that as a central focus point for the start of the conversations. So those are just a few examples, David. Great question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you anyone, very much, appreciate it. Anyone else have any thoughts or comments they'd like to add? We're not usually such a quiet group, I have to say. <laughs> I do see someone in the chat. Um, it's Jackie Nealon, if I'm correct. Um, in addition to the strategies you shared and insights you provided, how would you recommend we publicly show rather than tell prospective and current students and employees what our call-in culture means to us? Great question. Yes, great question. Um, one of the things that I'm a big fan of is, um, and we're going through this process right now in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, but in particular, um, we are, and let me give you a little bit of background. On my campus, we have a very tiered structure because of our size. So, of course, we have our president, we have our provost, and then we have um, all of our deans. So we have six colleges, and then we have an honors college. Under those colleges, we have departments, department chairs. So all these layers, if you will. What we asked our deans to do is actually um, to provide a statement of, of um, a, a statement of solidarity from the colleges, so from the six colleges, and then each of the departments were able um, to hinge or hang off of that college statement and provide their own specific statement based on their uh, area or their discipline. What's been profound about that is not only calling out things like Black Lives Matter, Juneteenth, our history of racism on our campus, history of, and, and almost every campus has some tie to slavery in this country. These are very difficult to, uh, discussions to have, but I think what's profound about it was that not only did they uh, articulate the topics that were priorities to them, but they also articulated the ways in which they would engage. And that uh, referred to respectful dialogue, civility, calling in versus call out culture with a link to the actual terminology and research on call in culture. Um, uh, when it came to uh, candid and courageous conversations, and all the literature around those particular topics. So I think it's very important that not only do we say what's our priority and what we wanna discuss, but also how we discuss it. So we can talk about race and gender and, and all the other isms and oppression and so forth and power every day, all day. But if we haven't made it clear as a campus community what our values are as far as our communication style for our campus, then we could implode. <laughs> it could be very dangerous. And so I would encourage you to hinge all of those together to be successful. Yeah, great question. Great question. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else? 
Shauna, uh, this is Christopher Barto, also from LIM College. And so maybe you could dig in a little bit more and build on what you were just talking about as it relates to student protests and the ways in which you've, um, you know, on your current campus or other campuses have encouraged that um, and supported it um, and tried to provide um, an outlet or platform for that to be, um, you know, positive and create, as you talked about, potentially leadership opportunities for students. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I think one of the um, one of the great opportunities on our campuses always is around our student government associations. Um, I think that um, for those campuses that don't have some type of training for student government, they should. Um, and part of that training should inherently include um, information about uh, safely protesting. Um, they would call it red tape, but we call it safety measures. <laughs> and so um, making sure that they do have a good education around what it means to protest. Um, and, you know, there are some things that can be, um, for example, um, challenging for students to hear, but once they understand the method behind the, mad the madness, they realize how our campuses are protecting them. Um, so a great example of this I've seen on a couple of different campuses that I've served on that, um, for example, my campus I would consider quite liberal in the national landscape. Um, however, we did have some uh, very, um, uh, very contentious protesters that came to campus. And one of the strategies that our campus safety used was to keep their back to our students and stay facing um, those that are not from our campus um, so that um, in some ways, if our students misstep, frankly, our police officers, officers didn't see it. That's not an obstruction, that's just the truth of the matter, but they're keeping their focus on those that are not part of our campus community and keeping them in check because they are, um, they're responsible to state, uh, state and government. They're, they're not responsible to Towson University's values. And so given that these are um, strategies where when students found out we were doing that, they were saying, we don't understand why the, you know, they're not watching over us. Actually, <laughs> we have them watching the, the enemy rather than watching the students. And, and so some of those types of strategies, and I'm not a police officer, for, so forgive me for tripping over language, but just to emphasize how we've partnered with, um, with students in ways that allow them to flatten the learning curve around what policies are in place to protect them. Um, and from there, that's when there's really some eye-opening experiences, experiences there. Um, I would suggest um, a, a few things I'm thinking about because I have a faculty brain and then I have my student affairs brain because I was in student affairs for 20 some years before I came over to faculty. Um, with the faculty brain of mine, I would suggest connecting to your faculty members who teach courses that possibly would intersect with some type of social unrest. So like I mentioned before, political science possibly, um, even if there's courses on communications in particular. Those are some of the faculty members that I would connect with and ask them about how they could infuse or in some way, um, not overhaul their entire course, but how would there be some connections between their coursework and understanding social unrest and social responsibility? How would all that tie together? Um, so that's a course piece. Um, a student development piece would be around what does leadership training look like for your SGA or what does it look like just for students in general if you happen to have an annual leadership conference or something of that sort on your campus that would be a great time to introduce that information. Um, also too I think it would be crucial to introduce faces with names so um, instead of oh that's just the police no that is sergeant so-and-so chief of police or that's doctor such and such that's general counsel or <laughs> putting faces with names and I know that can be a little more difficult at larger institutions uh, but I believe that's an opportunity for you all as well so just a few things off the top of my head that's great thank you you're so welcome okay anyone else any other thoughts or suggestions, ideas? No? Okay, well then I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Shauna. Your presentation was timely and very relevant and we really appreciate the time that you spent with us. Um, before we wrap up though, I do wanna put in a quick plug. We do have another session tomorrow at noon um, about rebooting your marketing for um, in these, difficult times. And also, um, don't forget that next Tuesday, June 30th, 
is the um, deadline to submit your proposals for our second wave or second part two of the Innovation Summit in July. So if you have any thoughts or ideas about what you would like to see presented in July, please let me know. Um, uh, with, yes, sorry, this is, this is Liz Marcuse from LIM College. Dr. Gold, this has been amazing. You kicked off last year's conference. You had me running out of the room. My head was spinning. I guess it was spinning so fast. I'm not sure I accomplished anything. This was an amazing conversation to have. And I would ask that if there is a way in which we could stay in touch with you as a group, as you share your knowledge with us, because many of us are from smaller institutions, which in one sense may make it more streamlined or more difficult. Um, but I think the dialogue needs to keep happening. And I think we as leaders need to be continuously educated, especially for those of us who are not, um, and I would say as a leader, not knowledgeable enough where I, I am willing to say I, there are things I need to learn and I want to do to change my campus. And if there's just a way in which we can have a lifeline to you back for another conference, Donna, I just think Dr. Gold is one of the most incredible people I've listened to. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And I have talked with her about that, Liz. So that's definitely something we can we can work on for sure. Liz, Donna certainly cannot get rid of me at this point. Um, so I'm grateful. Um, and thank you so much um, for listening. Um, I included my email in the chat, Shauna at goldenterprisesllc.com. If you want to send me an email directly, if it's something really particular. Um, if you don't remember that email or if you can't find it in the chat, Donna always has a direct line to me, of course. Um, when she emails, I respond very quickly. So, um, but if you have other questions, and I know for me, sometimes I need a little moment to process everything I've heard before I can come up with an intelligent question. Um, so if you need those moments, you know how to reach me in a couple of different ways, but I'm so blessed and fortunate to be with all of you. And I pray that you and your families are, are very safe during this time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that Shauna is actually the one who will be moderating um, the panel that I've been talking about of provosts talking about diversity and inclusion on our campuses at, on, during the July session. So she will be back with us um, during that session anyway. So we've already got that lined up and ready to go. Um, but again, if you think of anything else, if there's anything in particular you want to make sure is covered during our July session or you have any thoughts or a proposal idea, please just send those in to me. And again, a big thank you to the planning committee who has helped me put all of this together. And um, that is all I have. So thank you so much for participating. I appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.